And if our children want to go ahead and be dismissed this morning, they can go ahead and go now to Children's Church. If you got your Bibles with you, I'd ask that you take them and open them up to the book of James. James chapter 1. Today we're going to be looking at verses 19 and 20 as we walk through the book of James. James 1 verses 19 uh, and 20. God's word says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Uh, let's pray and we'll get started with our sermon this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I thank you for the chance to be here. Uh, Lord, I, I pray uh, according to your word. Lord, your, your word uh, tells us to be still and know that you are God. Lord, I pray that you would still our hearts, that you would uh, still our minds this morning. Uh, Lord, that we would uh, strive to be in tune with you. Uh, Lord, so often we get caught up in everything that's going on uh, in our lives. Lord, we get caught up in what's around us. Lord, we get caught up in our week. Uh, and Lord, we bring all of that with us uh, into this, uh, this sanctuary, Lord, on Sunday mornings. Uh, Lord, I pray that right now uh, we would just take time to lay all of that aside. Uh, and Lord, to fix our eyes solely upon you. Uh, Lord, that uh, we would not be distracted um, by the work that we uh, have to do. Lord, by the responsibilities that weigh upon us. Lord, by all the lists of things in our lives that we have to get done. Uh, but Lord, that for these next couple of minutes, uh, that it would be us, you, and your eternal word. Uh, and Lord, as such, that you would work on our hearts. Uh, Lord, that you would change us. Lord, that you would mold us. Uh, to be in your image, Lord, that you would shape us, not just on the outside, but in the, on the inside. Lord, that our hearts would be transformed. Uh, Lord, uh, made to be uh, hearts that bear your image and bear your likeness. Lord, that we could be made to be more and more like you. And Lord, that that would in turn change us on the outside. Lord, that, a, that we would have a, a heart that is sold out and dedicated to you, Lord. Uh, and, and as a result... Uh, Lord, that our lives would look like you. Our interactions with others would look like you. Lord, our conversations would bear your mark. Lord, and our thoughts would bear your fingerprints. Lord, I, I pray that whatever uh, secret sin is in our lives, Lord, that even now in this time of preparation, Lord, even now in this time of prayer, that we would get it right with you. Lord, any anger or frustration that we hold towards brothers or sisters in Christ, uh, Lord, that we would confess that to you now. Lord, that we might gain your word without any obstruction. Lord, without any obstacles. Lord, I, I pray that your spirit would be uh, allowed to move freely in the hearts of those in this congregation this morning. Lord, to uh, affect them. Lord, to enter not just their ears, but their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would work in me and through me. Lord, that you would have me to say the words that you want me to say this morning. Lord, that this uh, would not be any effort of my own, any passion of my own, uh, but Lord, that this would be you. Lord, that it would be about you. Lord, that your spirit would move freely in me. Lord, that he would give me the words to say. Lord, that it would not be this, me that speaks, Lord, but your spirit that speaks in me and through me. Lord, we, we ask that you would do something mighty in this, uh, this following time, Lord. We ask that you would lift high your holy name. Be with us as we look at your word and all this we pray in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We've been walking through the book of James, and uh, we've begun to transition a little bit. We've spent a lot of time in these previous weeks talking about trials, talking about uh, temptations, and, and how we as Christians ought to approach those, uh, what our attitude ought to look like uh, in, in the midst of those. And we've begun to talk about a little bit what our attitude, not just towards the situation and not just towards others, but our attitude towards God, uh, what that ought to look like. Understanding that when we are uh, drawn away to sin, that that is not God's fault, but ours. 
Uh, last week, we, we further looked at that fact, discussing how uh, really God does not draw us towards sin. In fact, God is the source of everything good in our lives. Uh, that every good gift uh, and every perfect gift comes from God. Uh, and then we began to look at what the greatest gift is that God has given us, being his son uh, and his sacrifice for us on Calvary. And then at the end of verse 18, uh, we discussed the fact that we are God's first fruits. We are his treasure, his possession, but also his evidence of what he is doing in this world. Uh, and that's exactly where our text for this week picks up. Uh, verse number 19, uh, James begins with the words, Wherefore, my beloved brethren. Uh, he, he uses that word, wherefore, to call our minds and our attention back to what he just spoke about. Uh, he says, wherefore, uh, in light of the fact that we are God's firstfruits. That's what that word is there to do. It is to uh, draw our attention back to the fact that we are indeed the Lord's first fruits. We are God's evidence of what he is doing and is going to do in this world. In essence, we are uh, God's testimonies, uh, God's ambassadors, uh, God's evidence, God's examples of one, who he is, and two, what he is doing. We are uh, testaments of God's redemptive work, uh, of God's work of regeneration in this world. Uh, and we are uh, testimonies and examples of the fact that he is going to continue to do these things. That he is going to continue to redeem the souls of lost mankind. That he is going to continue to regenerate those in this world and those things in this world that are lost and broken and spiritually dead. We are his evidence of the promised regeneration. And James uses that word, wherefore, because that's going to be a common theme at everything we look at this morning. That we are the Lord's first fruits, And that that should influence the way that we live our lives. The way that we speak to one another and interact with others in the world around us. He says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man... Uh, nobody gets a pass on what we're going to be discussing this morning. Uh, sometimes we, we come to church and we speak about things that maybe only apply to a majority or maybe in some cases they only apply uh, to a minority. And yet in this case, James says that everyone needs to hear what this verse has to say. Uh, nobody gets a pass on this truth uh, and that is because all of us struggle with what we are going to discuss this morning. There is not a person sitting in this room today that uh, in one way uh, or in one shape or in one form does not struggle with what James speaks about. Being swift to hear uh, and, and slow to speak and slow to wrath. Uh, that's how James sets up and introduces the verses that we're looking at this morning. Wherefore, in light of the fact that you are God's evidence of who he is and the work that he is doing in this world... Let every one of you, myself included, every person sitting in this room, every person that picks up this copy of God's word and reads it, let every one of us be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. We'll look at these three things this morning that James calls us to focus on, that James calls us to be, because we are God's first fruits. The first thing that he draws our attention to is that we ought to be swift to hear. What does this mean to be swift to hear? Well, often when we hear that word swift, we think of something that is uh, quick or something that is fast. Uh, and that is indeed part of what James means by this, that we ought to be uh, swift to listen, uh, quick uh, to listen, fast to listen. Uh, but he takes it one step further. He explains that we also ought to be ready. Uh, that we ought to be prompt. Uh, that there ought to be uh, no time of preparation when it comes to listening. Specifically, uh, hearing. Hearing the words of God. 
Uh, what is James driving at? That we ought to be always ready to hear or to take in God's words. We ought always to be ready to hear, uh, to listen to what God has to say. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we just spoke about it this morning, we, we find ourselves needing to take time to get ready. Uh, we find ourselves being in a state of not readiness, not alertness, uh, not promptness. Uh, we find ourselves being uh, spiritually dull, not sharp, not ready to be used, and yet that is exactly what James calls us to be. He tells us that we ought to be ready, prompt, always in a place spiritually and mentally to accept the truth of God. Uh, and the truth is, a lot of us aren't like that a lot of the time. Uh, we become dulled by the things of this world. Uh, we become uh, distracted uh, and weighed down uh, and, and, and dirty and, and, and heavy-minded when it comes to being ready to accept the things of God. And we find ourselves being more ready and more prompt and, and more in a state of acceptance to take on the things of this world or to take on the things of this flesh, to take on the things of man than we do to take on the things of God. James says that our readiness ought to be to hear, to listen to the words of God. Uh, if our spiritual birth begins with hearing the word of truth, then it follows that our growth as first fruits continues by hearing God's words. Uh, last week, we looked at verse 18. Look at verse 18 of James 1 again with me, if you would. It says, of his own will begat he us, or gave us spiritual birth. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. That's what we just said. That our spiritual growth begins with the word of truth. As we said, it would make sense then that our spiritual growth continues by hearing the words of truth, by hearing God's words. You know, the Bible illustrates this point. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to 2 Peter. The last verse of 2 Peter, 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, we receive this command to continue to grow as Christians. Uh, we've not just been given spiritual life to be born that way, but to grow in our spiritual life, to advance in the things of God. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Do you understand that growth ought to be a part of your spiritual life? Uh, we are not uh, saved uh, to remain in the same state that we are. Uh, in, in Josh Denny's class, we're going over Christian discipleship, maturing as Christians. And we spoke about the fact that when you get saved... Just like you would be as a human being, uh, an infant when you're first born, when you're saved, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are a spiritual infant. You're just coming into the spiritual wor world, just learning spiritual things. And yet I find that so many Christians have a protracted infancy. Uh, a, a, a prolonged state of being a spiritual baby, of being a spiritual infant. Uh, they, they forever remain in the shallow end of God's word and on the milk of his word, never advancing to the deep truths of scripture, never pushing into the depths of what God has provided for them through his word, always remaining on the spiritual milk and never moving to the spiritual meat. And yet we are commanded as Christians to grow. Second Peter makes that very clear. And so the question we must ask ourselves this morning is, am I growing as a Christian? From the time that I accepted Christ as my Savior to where I am right now, what sort of spiritual change has occurred in my life? Do I look more like my Savior now than I did when I first got saved? Do I look less like the world now than I did when I first got saved? 
I find that, that so many Christians uh, don't want to grow. They, they have no desire to advance in their spirituality, that there is a comfort and complacency in where that they are at, that they enjoy still the things of the world, that they have grown comfortable with being in the, the shallow end of spiritual things, and yet Second Peter tells us that we must grow. How do we grow as Christians? It is what James is speaking about, by being swift to listen. It is through the words of God. Uh, turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 4 uh, and verse number 4. In Matthew 4, we find the temptation of Jesus right before he begins his ministry here on earth. And Satan begins to come and tempt him. And Christ's response to the first temptation is exactly what we're speaking of this morning. In Matthew chapter 4, verse number 4, it says that, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If you are not listening to God's word, if you are not taking in God's truth, you cannot grow spiritually. If you are not taking time to search the scriptures, to study and show yourself approved unto God, to give your ear to the Lord and to his spirit, to listen to what he has to say, you cannot grow as a Christian. You will not grow as a Christian. And as such, you will be grossly inept to handle what this life throws at you. Because the temptations of life don't wait to scale based on your level of spirituality. The longer you are a Christian, the harder your temptations will be. That is why God calls us to grow with him. That is why we are commanded to advance in our Christianity, to grow in our spirituality. Because if you don't, as we've seen earlier in the book of James, you will be swallowed up by temptations covered over by them, unsure of what to do or where to go. And so James seeks to help us combat that by saying that we must grow as Christians. He gives us the advice of being swift to listen. What does it look like to be swift to listen? What does it look like to uh, be swift to hear? Uh, we are commanded to be ready, prompt, sharp, to hear the words of God. In order for this to happen, two things must be true about us. Firstly, it must be our desire. If you do not desire to hear the words of God, you will not hear them. You know, the Bible speaks about this desire that we must have. Now, turn to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse number 16. Is this your attitude towards God's words? Is this how you view his truth and his scriptures? Jeremiah 15, verse 16, the prophet writes, he says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. Do you desire God's word? Do you seek to feast on it? To take it in? Is it the joy of your heart? Is time with God the rejoicing of your existence? Or does your word remain, or does your copy of God's word, I should say, remain largely unopened? Largely uneaten? Maybe brought with you when we have time here at church, but not opened through the week, or barely cracked. Is God's word the joy of your heart? Jeremiah says at the end of that verse, yeah, well, we'll read the whole verse again. He says, thy words were found, I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Why? For I am called by thy name. If you are a Christian sitting in this room today, if you claim to have a relationship with Jesus, God's word makes it very clear that you are called by him. 
Jeremiah says, God's words are the joy and rejoicing of my heart because I am called by him. If you are a Christian, it should be natural to you that you enjoy God's word. You should have that desire within you. You should want to spend time with him. This is one of the, 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 the few ways that we as Christians get a chance to spend time with almighty God. It is through his words. How can we be swift to hear? How can we grow as Christians? We must desire to hear. We must desire to listen, to say with Jeremiah that I want to feast on God's word, that I found it and that I ate it and that it was the joy and rejoicing of my heart. He says it's a joy because I'm called. If you don't desire God's word, what does that say about your calling? Uh, my desire is not to get anyone to question their salvation. But the Bible does tell us to make our calling and election sure that there is evidence of the fact that the Spirit is within us. How can someone who has been regenerated, how can someone who is supposed to be a first fruits of God's work of redemption not desire his word? Not desire to be in church and hear his word opened every chance they can get especially after being bombarded with all the things of this world. I remember before I, I got into ministry that I, I used to work uh, in commercial construction. Uh, and I, I, those of you who have worked in commercial construction know that it's, it's not always the, the most spiritual environment. People don't always say the most godly things or don't always uh, speak with the most godly words. It was such a blessing for me to get to come to church to be around like-minded people and hear God's word opened. But that desire doesn't come from within me. Uh, no good thing comes within me. It, it comes from the Lord. The fact that his spirit now dwells within me, that he has changed the intents and desires of my heart. If you're a Christian, your desires should be changed. You should want to be here every chance you can get. You should be looking for excuses to get out of things to come to church. Not excuses to get out of coming to church. When the doors are open, we ought to be here to take in God's word. That's why being at church is important. Because it's where we get to hear his truth. But not just here, all throughout the week. We must be swift to hear, desiring to hear the words of God. Not only should it be our desire, but it also requires discernment. Uh, turn, if you would, to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17, verse number 10. Being swift to hear requires that you have a desire, one, to hear the things of God, but it also requires that, that you and I be discerning. Uh, and, and we'll explain why in, in just a second. Let's read this verse. Acts 17, verse 10, it says, And the brethren, th those are Christians, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than they in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Right here we have described a group of people uh, that we refer to in church culture uh, as the Bereans. Uh, and the Bereans are often held in high regard because of what they did in that verse we just read. They were swift to receive the word, to listen to it, to hear it, but then what did they do? They took time to search the scriptures and to see if those things were true. Friends, that's what James calls us to do. That's what being swift to hear looks like. You see, we, we live so much in a culture, and, and we'll, we'll push into this a little bit as we continue to go through our text today, but we live in a culture where conversation does not happen, where people are, are extremely polarized. And the moment somebody doesn't agree exactly what I believe, 
My walls go up, conversation ends, I'm no longer listening to them, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say in response to them, and I'm getting frustrated, and my, my passions and my anger are getting churned up within me. And yet James says that we ought to be swift to listen. Not to come up with what I'm going to say in my mind in response to them, but to hear what that person has to say. That does not mean that you have to agree with that person. That's why we're called to be discerning. That's why we went and looked at these people, the Bereans. But what did they do first? They listened. They heard what Paul had to say, and then they examined the scriptures. If you and I are going to be swift to listen, we must desire to hear the words of God, desire to hear truth be given, but we also must be discerning with it, taking it and comparing it against Scripture to see if it is indeed true. Why does it matter, though? Why should I strive to be swift to hear? What, what is the application, the, the purpose in my own life? Why does it matter? Well, the truth is, those who do not hear cannot do. Those who do not hear cannot do. We're speaking about growing as Christians. Part of growing as a Christian is doing the things that God has called us to do. He's not just our Savior, but he's our Lord. My life now belongs to him. Everything I do is for his honor and for his glory, or it ought to be that way. But those who do not hear, those who do not have ears to hear those who do not have a desire to hear the things of God, they cannot do the things of God. Uh, If you go back to James, uh, and and we'll look at these verses in in the upcoming weeks, but James chapter 1, look at verse 22. James 1, verse number 22, uh, he writes and he says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Those two things ought to be inseparable, though often they aren't. And as I said, we'll get to that in in later weeks as we continue to walk through the book of James. But notice, before there is ever doing, James says that there must be hearing. If you do not practice consciously, intently, with desire, being swift to hear, swift to be instructed and grow and learn the things of God, you cannot and will not be able to properly do the things of God. Either you just won't do them at all, or you will do them the wrong way. And that's why we have so many people that are sincere, but they're sincerely wrong, focused on doing, but not on listening to how God tells them to do it and what it ought to look like. James says that we are first fruits. How shall first fruits grow without listening? How can you be evidence of God's work without first being swift to hear? James encourages us to grow. He tells us the first part of that growth is being swift to hear, but he goes on in our text. He says, not only must we be swift to hear in verse 19, he says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. And then he says, be slow to speak. What does this mean? We've examined what it means to be swift to hear. Now he presents us with what seems to be the opposite, with being slow to speak. Uh, Slow, uh, as we just mentioned, quite literally is the opposite of what the swift was we just looked at. Where swift is uh, being quick uh, and fast, being ready and prompt, slow is being all of the opposites. Uh, Being dull, being not ready, being not fast. It is exactly as the word suggested is being slow, being dull, not with hastiness, not with readiness. 
where you and I are commanded to be sharp and ready, attentive when it comes to listening, always ready to take in and hear what those around us have to say, especially in regards to the word of God and growing in our Christianity, we ought to be all the opposite things when it comes to responding to that person. Not quick to give an answer, not ready to give a retort, but dull, slower, not prompt, uh, not ready. It says that we ought to be slow to speak, especially in response to matters of the faith. But what does this look like? What does it mean to be slow to speak? Uh, We are commanded to be reserved in our responses. We're called to take time before we respond for two reasons. Uh, Firstly, we are called to take time before we respond so that we give ourselves a chance to listen, to do the very thing that we just said we ought to be doing. You see, when I'm prepared uh, to speak or when I am speaking, it makes it very, very hard for me to listen. And so by being slow to speak, it gives us time to listen to what the person is saying. Uh, Go back to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18, uh, verse number 13. We're commanded to be reserved in our responses, taking time so as to listen. Proverbs 18, 13, it says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, before he has taken time to listen to it in its entirety, he that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. I I can tell you one thing. I I don't want to enter into folly. I don't want to enter into shame. The Bible says the way that we avoid that is by taking time to listen, being slow to speak, letting the person that is speaking to us, instructing us, teaching us on the things of God, letting them finish before we shut them out or respond, hearing what they have to say, taking time so as to listen, but also taking time so as to understand. Uh, Those two things are different, though we often conflate them together. We must take time to hear what the person is saying, to listen, but then also take time to process that information, uh, to to understand it. Miscommunication is is, is one of the leading causes uh, of, of issues in relationships, and sometimes it's because One person doesn't take time to listen to the other, but most often it's because one person doesn't take time to understand where the other person is coming from. Understanding is is key uh, in what James is speaking about. It is key in this act of listening. And the only time we understand is when we are slow to speak. Uh, Go back to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, verse number 12, Peter has some very strong language to describe those who do not take time to listen, uh, but, but rather speak out. Uh, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 12, he says, speaking specifically about false teachers, um, but really the, the truth is applied to those that speak out of turn uh, or speak about that which they do not understand in general. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 12, he says, But these, as natural brute beasts, as uncontrolled animals, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Peter says those that speak about that which they they do not understand, he likens them to out-of-control animals, wild beasts. Uh, So often in, in Christianity, we disagree 
with one another on things. Uh, and, and they may not be the most fundamental things to our faith. Maybe they're smaller things than that, but we get very fractured over those things. Uh, and, and instead of having a uh, conversation about them, uh, we speak about things that we don't actually understand. Things that we've been told, but we've never taken time to study on our own. Uh, and when someone begins to speak about that thing that maybe uh, we don't understand or maybe we disagree with, instead of hearing them out, we're quick to give a, a response to them, and an angry response about why they're wrong and, and why they're mistaken and why they're immature and why they're stupid because they believe something like that. And the Bible says all those people that speak about that which they do not understand are likened unto animals. People that set themselves up for destruction. James warns us, he says, be swift to hear, slow to speak. Why does it matter that I am slow to speak? Because there is great weight and responsibility to your words. What you say to someone how you instruct someone or how you respond to their instruction, there's a lot of weight behind those words that you use. And as such, there is great responsibility in those words. Uh, Proverbs 18, uh, verse number 21, uh, describes the, the weight of our words. I'll read it real quickly. It'll be on the screen for sake of time. Uh, Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Your words have the ability to build up or tear down. Your words have the ability to uh, remind someone of the life that it, God has given them or to point them towards the death that they feel is inevitable. There is power of death and life in your words. And so when we choose to speak, we are held responsible for what it is that we say. You know, James speaks about this, James 3, 1. He says, my brethren, be not many masters, many teachers, many instructors, knowing that we who are instructors, we who are preachers, pastors, Sunday school teachers, we who stand and seek to instruct other people in matters of spirituality, in whatever context that is, that we shall receive the greater condemnation. That if you stand and you have the mind to instruct somebody on things of the scripture, that you are held responsible for that. And that if you're wrong about those things, that there is a greater condemnation that awaits us. And so, as we return to the idea of God's first fruits, we ask ourselves the question how do your words represent God's first fruits? How do your interactions with your brothers and sisters in Christ represent God's work of redemption and mercy and grace in this world? How do you respond to those that seek to guide you and instruct you and teach you in the things of God? Do you accept it with all readiness, swift to listen, or are you rather swift to speak, to defend your position because you're afraid of being told that what you believe may be wrong according to the pages of Scripture? Swift to hear, slow to speak, and swiftly we'll try to look at this last one. We're running out of time this morning. Uh, verse number 19 of James 1 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, uh, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. What does this mean, this slow to wrath? We've already looked at that word slow, understanding it's not hasty, that there's a dullness to it. But he says this time that we ought to be slow to wrath. Wrath is a heightened emotion uh, or passion. It is an anger, uh, a temper that gets flared up within us. And this too is paired with being slow. That we all not to be quick to have our temper flare up when we disagree with someone over something. Especially the things of God. What does this look like? It is, means that we ought to be slow to become heated in discussion or debate, not letting the disagreements and the differences that we have develop or really, I ought to say, devolve into anger. Uh, so often we get angry and disagree with one another as a result of pride that lies hidden within us. Uh, go back to Proverbs, if you would. 
Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 10. Proverbs 13, verse number 10, Solomon writes, he says, only by pride. It is the only cause. It is the only root. It is the only genesis and origin. Only by pride cometh contention, cometh friction in the body, cometh disagreements and differences that devolve into anger. Only by pride cometh this negative disagreement, this contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Pride is what causes these disagreements that cause that anger to boil within us or that haughtiness to develop within us, thinking that because they don't believe what I believe, they must not be as spiritual as I am. They've not arrived to the spiritual level that I've made it because they don't agree with me in every minutia of what I believe. You see, those who desire to know truth and those who desire to pursue truth are swift to listen. Whereas those who cannot accept that they have more truth to learn are swift to speak and swift to wrath. If I ever get to the place where I am not teachable, then I have failed to be what I am supposed to be as a pastor because I am very far from knowing everything. There's not a person in here that has arrived at the pinnacle of all Christian truth and knowledge. And so it's just like we said, those who desire to know and pursue truth are those who are swift to listen. Whereas those who cannot accept that they have more truth to learn or that they might be wrong about something are always those who are swift to speak and swift to wrath. Which one are you? Which one do your actions say you are? Are you swift to hear? Your actions then speak that you're one that desires truth. Or are you rather swift to speak, to always defend your point, to always get angry and frustrated and argue with anyone who holds a slightly different view. Your actions say that you're one that cannot accept that there's more truth to be learned. Why does this matter? Why does it matter that I'm slow to wrath? Verse 20 of our text tells us, James 1.20, it says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wrath worketh not righteousness. That word worketh means produces or practices. You see, many reverse the commands of this verse on the grounds of defending righteous truth. They say, I'm going to be slow to listen because I don't want to hear the lies that you're propagating. And I'm going to be swift to speak and swift to anger because someone has to stand for truth and someone has to stand for righteousness. And we switch those truths around in our mind. Uh, convincing ourselves uh, that we are defending righteous truth, justifying uh, what we be, uh, justifying our swift to speakness, justifying our, our swiftness to get uh, righteously anger for God. And listen, I'm not saying that we ought not to stand for truth. The Bible tells us that we ought to defend our faith. Uh, Jude, verse number three, uh, he says, it'll be on the screen, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you, to encourage you, to command you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. We should fight and stand for truth. That's why on Sunday nights, we're going over doctrine, shoring up the foundation of what we believe. But how do you interact with others about that doctrine? Are you swift to hear, to have conversation about it, and to open up God's word with desire and discernment to see what truth is? Or are you always shutting down, walling up, getting angry because not everyone believes exactly how you believe on things that the Bible doesn't even discuss or make clear? You see, it requires discernment of swift listening and the understanding of slow speaking if we're going to defend truth. And what we do is we justify our defense of tradition as a defense of truth. 
We justify our defense of tradition as a defense of truth. Well, we've always done it that way. Shouldn't we continue to do it that way? I'm going to stand for doing it that way because it's what we've always done. And I'm standing for truth by standing for what we've always done when all the while that's not truth, it's just tradition. And it has no basis or grounding in the scriptures. And we become more and more fractured and divided over stuff that doesn't even matter. All the while paying less and less attention to the things that do. You see, when we try to defend righteousness with anger in our hearts, we neither produce it nor practice it. The person that stands in anger and is swift to speak and says, I'm speaking this way and I'm speaking quickly because I'm defending God's righteousness. The Bible says that that person neither practices nor produces righteousness. The very thing they think they're defending, they are making themselves farther from because of the attitude of their heart. The Bible tells us that righteousness is not sown in wrath, but in something else. Uh, turn to James 3 is the last place we'll be, we'll be done. James 3, verse number 16. James 3, verse number 16. He says, For where envying and strife is, there is confusion, and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is not sown in wrath, but rather is sown in peace of them that make peace. If you want to defend God's righteousness, do it with an attitude of peace. Do it with an attitude of love. I'm not telling you not to defend truth or to soften it or to sugarcoat it. James says, earnestly contend for the faith. But if wrath and pride is what drives you to defend righteousness, you do more disservice to God and Christianity than you would by saying nothing at all. What does your attitude say about God's first fruits? If you are the example of what God is going to do in this world, what do your words, your listening habits, and your attitude tell the world about who God is and what he's going to do? It's not if we are the standard for what God is doing, it is we are the standard for what God is doing. It's not if we become his first fruits, it's we already are his first fruits if we're saved. We already are his example. And so James says, wherefore, because you are those things as a Christian, let every man, every person in here, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we come to the end of our service. We'll have our, our time of invitation, a chance for you to do business with God. And so with nobody looking around, uh, the piano will begin to play here in just a moment. I want you to begin to ask yourselves some questions. They may not be questions that are easy. They may not be questions that are fun, but they are questions that need to be asked. What kind of first fruit am I? What about how I listen does that tell the world about my Savior? What about how I speak tells the world about my Jesus? What about how my attitude looks like? How does that describe our Lord to this lost world? Perhaps you say this morning, I know that I'm called by God. I know that he saved me. 
that he's done a work in my life, but I don't practice these things. I need to really work on being swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. If that's you this morning, I'd urge you not just to say those words in your heart, but to do something about it, to make a commitment and a promise to God. That is what this altar is for. It is for people coming and giving aspects of their life to God that they've yet to give him. The altar is an Old Testament piece of furniture where an object is given to the Lord, consecrated to him. Do you need to give the Lord your listening? Do you need to give the Lord your speaking? Do you need to give the Lord the attitude of your heart? Nobody's looking around, but that's exactly what this time is, an opportunity for you to come here to the altar or there in your seat to make a commitment with God to give him those parts of your life, to let him regenerate them and redeem them and use them for his honor and glory. Maybe this morning, it's not just parts of your life that you need to have redeemed, but your life as a whole. You know that you're yet to be saved, that you've not given your heart to Christ, that you've never asked him to be your savior, to forgive you of your sins. You never trusted what he did on the cross as the only payment for your sins. You're not really sure you're going to heaven. You hope you are. You think you are, but you couldn't say with confidence, I know that my eternal home is heaven. Maybe, maybe that's you this morning. And you say, I need to be saved. I'm tired of going through my life unsure. I'm ready to have some confidence. I don't just need to give part of my life to Christ. I need to give all of my life to Christ. If that's you, no one is looking around, but... I'd encourage you, if you know you need to be saved, that if you would just slip your hand up. If you're a, 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 a lady, we'll have a lady pray with you. If you're a man, we'll have a man pray with you. Take God's word and show you how you can be forgiven of your sins by what Christ did for you on the cross. I'll be quiet for just a moment. Let people do business with the Lord. And then we'll close our service today. If God is working on your heart, don't ignore him. Seek him while he may be found. chance to be here this morning. Lord, I thank you for those that are here this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, so many things to be thankful for, so many blessings you've given us. Lord, above all else is your salvation, and your mercy and your grace. Lord, that, that mercy and grace that reached down and saved the heart of a sinner like me. And Lord, that mercy and grace that I still continue to experience each and every day. Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church to gain hold of our ears, to gain hold of our words, Lord, to gain hold of our hearts and our attitudes. Lord, that you might gain hold of them, not just us. Lord, that they might be honoring and pleasing to you. Lord, I pray that you would be with our church. Lord, I pray that we would take to heart the things that we have been uh, commanded to by scripture this morning. Lord, I, I pray that you would bring us back safely tonight uh, as we continue to look at doctrine. Lord, I pray that you would mold us in your image, Lord, that we would be uh, first fruits that are honorable to you, vessels unto honor, Lord, that we could uh, properly represent you and the work that you've done in our hearts to this world. Lord, this world needs you now more than ever, and you've asked us to be witnesses. Lord, I pray that that would start here with the people in this church, being mindful of how they listen, what they say, and how they react. Lord, I thank you for this chance to look at your word. Be with us now, Lord. I pray you would bring us back safely tonight. And all this we pray in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.